Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari ST A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari ST games, some of which I grew up with, and some of which are new to me. Today is one of the former. Today is Revenge 2, a 1988 release by Mastertronic, and a port of Jeff Minter's game Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2, which was also known as Return of the Mutant Camels in some places as well. Um, now this was uh, quite an interesting game with a slightly convoluted story behind it, because um, this game, despite being marketed as Jeff Minter's Revenge 2 on the packaging, actually doesn't really have a lot to do with Jeff Minter, uh, or this port doesn't anyway. So Jeff Minter created the original Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2, or Return of the Mutant Camels, whatever you want to call it. But this port was nothing to do with him. Um, it was just ported by a group of other people. And in fact, the fact that Minter didn't have anything directly to be to do with this port in the first place caused it to get some fairly negative reviews at the time of release, which was a bit of a shame because it's a fairly solid game in its own right. Um, so despite Minter not being involved at all, it's got a lot of his trademark humour, a lot of his uh, silly gameplay and stuff like that. And it's also quite an interesting release in that it went straight to budget via uh, Mastertronic. Now, if you watched last week's episode on Quest for Galaxia, when we talked a little bit about uh, public domain and shareware, uh, I gave you that quote from Jeff Minter about how shareware was a way that um, developers could distribute their games without having to go via large publishers and having to sort of deal with a lot of the same considerations that uh, AAA has to deal with today. Um, and the first Revenge of the Mutant Camels game is actually available on Atari ST. Jeff Minter released it via the shareware model. Uh, but then this subsequent one came out as a commercial release via Mastertronic. Now, as I say, Jeff Minter didn't have anything directly to do with this particular release, but I just find it interesting that it sort of evolved over that process. And he went from experimenting with the shareware model with quite a few games to um, doing another commercial release, but a straight to budget publication. And the package here is fairly typical for straight to budget releases from the period. So we've got this sort of CD case type form factor here um, and not a lot going on so inside we've got the disc itself uh, which is running on the machine behind me at the minute uh, and then actually inside the inlay we've got the instructions here so rather than a separate instruction sheet we've just got it's actually printed on the inside so here is the story for revenge of the mutant camels 2 the president of earth speaks we the people of earth are long unused to the rigors of conflict Having been many millennia a unified you yeah, can't speak today. Having been many millennia a unified people, seeking only to roam amongst the stars, learning and sharing our knowledge with such sentient beings as we might encounter on our way. However, we have recently recently learned of the reemergence of our ancient enemy, the Empire of Zyzax, and of its plans to strike at our very homeworld and destroy our race forever. Thus we are forced to fall upon this, our last defence left by our ancestors of 6,000 years ago, against the day that the blight of Zyzax returned to darken the galaxy. The doings of those ancestors and their triumph over the mighty and tyrannical Zyzaxian Empire have long since become the stuff of rumour and legend. Suffice to say that as far as we can tell, the myth can be traced back to actual historical events. These are that, a, at some time before mankind availed themselves of an interstellar drive and left the Earth, they were adept in genetic engineering, and utilised mutated forms of contemporary beasts such as engines of warfare. And, sorry, I read that wrong, didn't I? And utilised mutated forms of contemporary beasts as engines of warfare, and that certain of these enhanced forms were abducted and used in turn against the human forces by alien adversaries. If you played Attack of the Mutant Camels or watched my previous episode on that on the Atari A to Z series, you'll know all about that. B. These beasts were persuaded to rebel against their captors and fight on the side of Earth in the epic conflict known as the Revenge of the Mutant Camels. They subsequently returned to Earth, persuaded by a number of cerebrally enhanced goats, an earthly species of astonishing beauty sadly now extinct, and after their return we know not, was, not what was their fate, bar a few shards of data distorted wildly by the passage of eons. We do believe that these beasts may have something to do with this ultimate defence left us against the Zyzaxians, and that they represent our last hope against defeat by the Zyzaxian evil. Thus, I have given the coded RF signal that will reactivate the ancient defence station on the dark side of the moon. God help us in our time of need, and God help the Zyzaxians if the legends be true and we have let loose the mutant camels of old amongst them. So, I mean, yeah, this is Jeff Minter through and through, um, even though he didn't program this Atari ST port. This is absolutely 100% a Jeff Minter game, as you will see once we start playing it. So let's stop talking and let's go and actually play it. 
Okay, here we are with Revenge of the Mutant Camels 2, a Yak production, so originally by Jeff Minter, but then subsequently ported to ST by SA Riding of Icon Design Limited. With sprites and backgrounds by Paul Windet, and more sprites by Mo McNulty, G music by Jason C. Brooks, and so on. So, this was released in 1988 by Mastertronic, and I remember rather enjoying this, despite the quite poor reviews it got, at, it got at the time. So, as I said in the intro, a lot of those poor reviews seem to stem from the fact that Jeff Minter wasn't directly involved with this, despite his name being all over it. Which was a bit of an unfortunate thing, really, because, I mean... Yes, Jeff Minter is a great developer, and still is a great developer, and a lot of his games are very worthwhile. But that doesn't mean that you should ignore the ports of his stuff to other platforms just because other people worked on them. Because there were quite a few of his games over the years that were ported by people who weren't him. Um, and obviously there's a, there is a distinct magic of Minter doing stuff himself. He has a very distinctive way of doing things and of taking advantage of the hardware at the time. Um, but at the same time, yeah, other people can port his humour perfectly well. So, let's take a look at how this game plays. So, um, you can choose where you want to begin in this game, as I recall, anyway. Uh, you can purchase new items, but we have no credits and nothing with nothing at the minute, so we just have to begin, I think. Okay, so the way this works is you have a camel who can move left, right, and jump into the air. And you fire by holding down the fire button and pushing in a direction. But you also move your camel when you're doing that as well. So you have to kind of take that into account when you're moving. You also have to take into account the fact that when you shoot stuff down, uh, their bodies will sort of land on you. And so what you want to try and do is shoot them so that they land somewhere where you're not standing. But this is not a one-hit kill game. So you have that energy bar at the top of the screen. So if you do get hit, it's not the end of the world. And when you're flying in the air, you drop these adorable little camel bombs onto the ground as well, so... And there we go, that's the first level complete. So at this point you get a bit of a top-up on your energy. It's not a, it's not a full top-up to your energy, uh, but you do... Um, you do get some back. And, and so that's the way that the game is sort of structured. So you have to try and... Um, go through the game in such a way that you preserve as much energy as possible um, rather than losing more than you gain in between levels. Now we've also got 18 credits from that first level which we can then spend on stuff. Uh, I can't remember how you actually go about doing that. Oh, there we go. I've, I've done it. I've apparently bought some shields. That's it. So, if you, so in that sort of uh, psychedelic map over on the left of the screen, if you click on a, a square that you've already completed, such as that top left corner one, you can then choose stuff from this list, spend your credits on them, and uh, then off you go. And then you push back to the left to get back to the map. So let's try this level next. So th this level is a pretty good example of sort of the the kind of thing you can typically expect from Jeff Minter, which is references to other things. So here we've got angry Pac-Men and ghosts, and we've got these things on a spring down to the bottom here, are very obviously a reference to Zebedee from the Magic Roundabout. Um, which, if you're not British, probably doesn't mean anything to you, but uh, suffice to say, if you enjoy taking a lot of drugs, or certainly feeling like you've taken a lot of drugs, then the Magic Roundabout is something you should very much check out, because it's uh, a British institution, shall we say. Oh, I'm dead. Okay, so at that point, um, you can't go back and try another wave that you've died on previously. You have to then go and choose a different one. Uh, so at this point you can move on to the next one in that sequence if you want to. And basically how it works is, when you complete or die in a wave, you can then go in any of the cardinal directions out from there. So I can go down from here, I can go to the right from here, or I can go down from the starting area. So let's try going down from the starting area, see if we do a bit better in that one. Uh, 
Alright, we've got little camels, unicorns, and more Zebedees this time. Well, hopefully, we're slightly easier to deal with. So yeah, one of the things people didn't like about this too much at the time, besides it not being created by Jeff Minter, was the control scheme. And yes, that control scheme does take quite a lot of getting used to, because it's... It's sort of almost simulating a twin stick setup, but not. And particularly staying in control of the camel when you jump and fly is quite tricky, because... The camel jumps up very quickly, so it's quite difficult to control your altitude. We're dead again. This is no good, is it? It's time to fight some pants and alarm clocks and toothbrushes and toothpaste. Yeah, so as you can as you can hopefully tell from um, the general nature of the enemies we're fighting here, the original plot that I read out to you in the intro has no bearing on this whatsoever. But again, that was pretty pretty standard for. Um, Jeff Minter or Jeff Minter inspired productions. Why are the Zoys actions attacking us with pairs of Y fronts and alarm clocks? I don't know. They just are. And it doesn't matter why, because it's funny. <laughs> ah, actually finished the level. How about that? Ooh, credits. Right. Uh, so, what can we spend those on? Okay, well we can spend 15 to get our energy back to full again, which is probably worth doing. And we don't have any more money to do that, so let's continue in this direction here. What we ideally probably want to try and do is get some of those uh, either smart or giant bullets. Because they make actually hitting stuff and dealing with these enemies a lot easier. I do like the parallax scrolling in this game. It's sort of understated, but it does the job really well and gives a nice sense of depth to the visuals. And it does feel like the old Mutant Camels games. It does feel very much like the Attack of the Mutant Camels backgrounds with the with the pyramids and the Egyptian and desert-inspired stuff. So, Yeah, again, although it may sort of lack the expected psychedelia of a Jeff Minter production, apart from on that map screen, which I, I completely forgotten about, to be perfectly honest, but uh, yeah, it's delightfully colourful. Um, yeah, that's more like it. Right, uh, okay, let's purchase some giant... giant bullets? Or smart bullets? Oh, we can get both, can't we? Okay, alright, let's get giant bullets. And... can we get smart bullets as well? Apparently we can. Okay. Well, let's see what happens with those then. Aha. Right, so smart bullets follow stuff around the screen. But it does look like you might only be able to have either smart or giant at once. So yeah, that makes things much easier because it means you can just concentrate on dodging things rather than having to position yourself perfectly to line up the firing, so... Yeah, that might well be a good choice. Don't know how long these last for. If they're permanent or if they only last for a level. I guess we'll find out when we uh, reach the end of this one. Oops! Or when we die. Alright, uh, so no more credits. Let's carry on. And... Yeah, back to normal bullets. Back to normal bullets while we fight burgers. Now you see in this one we've actually got some enemies who are on the floor and they're below our firing line. So this is where we have to have to start using the camel bombs. Oh, I'm doing very badly. Get up. Get 
Yeah, so this is a, a tricky game to get to grips with, but it, I've always had kind of a soft spot for it. I remember liking it when it first came out, despite the despite the reviews of the time. Um, and yeah, I still like it now. I'm having a good time with this. Don't think we're going to last much longer though, somehow. <laughs> it's access cards. Yeah, so these are um, credit cards that don't exist anymore. So here in the UK, we used to have Visa. We used to, well, we still have Visa and we still have Mastercard, but we also used to have Access, um, which was like this. So their logo was like a, a sort of heavily stylized A, but that was often represented in advertising media as sort of a a credit card man with a big moustache. Oh, we're dead. You have completed 3%. Oh, that's very good, isn't it? I have one more go at that because I, I enjoyed that and I've got a better, a better handle on how it all works now. So, let's go from the beginning and do better. These hearts, you might notice, you can actually continue shooting them while they're falling and you can get more points from them for that. It's also quite interesting that this this sort of falling enemies thing that they've got going on here doesn't continue in the other levels. You would have probably noticed that in the other levels, when you destroy something, it just stays destroyed. With a few exceptions. So those access cards in the last level we encountered, they were actually expanding in size when we shot them. So you had to hit them twice before you could defeat them. I also think this stuff is start, starts to do more damage the further you go as well, because we're not taking very much damage from these hearts at all. Whereas in the later levels, we were taking a hell of a lot of damage from everything. <laughs> Alright, so let's grab those smart bullets again, because they seem to be pretty good. So we'll get a packet of them. And onward to this level. So again, as long as we concentrate on the avoiding things... Which is harder than it sounds, actually, when stuff is flying at you as fast as it does here. Oh, I'm, I'm not massively confident. No, there we go. Dead. So there's certainly not a win button. <laughs> Let's try this one. Oh, this is unpleasant. Although those movement patterns are actually pretty predictable, so you can you can position yourself in safe spots on the screen, which I'm spectacularly failing to do right now. Oh dear. Oh dear. I'm just embarrassing myself right now. Okay, let's try this one. It's worth noting that you don't actually have to shoot anything. All you need to do is actually complete the level. So you just need to survive long enough for that kilometer counter at the top of the screen to reach zero. But I think the the credits you get are probably related to your score or how many things you shot or something like that. So. I am pathetic. Worse than nothing. Right, continue. Oh, we're into some medieval inspired stuff now. And once again fighting telephones. Yeah, this is a cool little game. Um, I mean, it's not the best by any means, and the control scheme does take some getting used to, as I've said. 
But that sort of sense of good, silly, absurd, surreal humour is very much present and correct. It's an enjoyable game, and it's important to remember that it was really starting to budget as well, so this was designed to be a game that you'd buy with pocket money, rather than something that you'd need to save up for, so it's not sort of a like a, a high-class production or anything like that, it's just designed to be something to have a bit of fun with, which uh, it fulfills that function pretty perfectly, I'd say. Alright, let's buy some giant bullets. Um, anything else we can buy? Shield Factor 2. Presumably that makes us take less damage. Let's find out. Ah, uh, there's our giant bullets. Oh no, it's the access cards again. I'm getting off the ground, because they're... Yeah, I think we maybe are taking a bit less damage using the the shields. Kind of hard to say. I choose to believe that we're taking less damage, and I didn't waste 12 credits. But yeah, looking like at this rate we should actually be able to make it through this level, eh? Those odd ones that come flying in from the right aside. There we go. Nicely done. Now, I guess we'll find out if we actually get to hold on to things like the giant bullets and stuff. So let, let's uh, let's find out. No. Okay, so they reset after each level. And they become more expensive each time you buy them as well. So, in fact, in some cases, it's in your interest to not buy the power-ups in the early stages that you know you can complete easily. Because each time you buy them, you're going to make them more expensive. So once you get a feel for how the game works, it's probably a good idea to sort of save your credits in the early stages and... Um, Oops. Yeah, save your credits in the early stages and then purchase stuff for the stuff you find a bit more difficult later on. Okay, so these are yo-yo bullets, so these bounce around the screen. They, they don't directly home in on anything, but they do bounce. Which uh, apparently killed me more quickly than, than anything else. And I completed 3%. Anyway, that is Revenge of the Mutant Camels, or Revenge 2 as it's known on the Atari ST. Thank you very much for watching. I said that wrong, didn't I? As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects moegamer.net where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today and videopackgames.wordpress.com which aims to catalogue the small but well formed library of the Philips G7000 video pack computer also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Thank you.